Star Citizen is a globally distributed project. With five studios across four countries and two continents, people from all over the world have come to Cloud Imperium to help make those tandem games we're creating all that they can be. But the Persistent Universe and Squadron 42, with some minor exceptions for Xi'an and Banu, have been a mostly English affair so far. That single language focus is not uncommon during the development of any project, but as we approach the next major milestones for Star Citizen and Squadron 42, it's become time to begin the process of expanding our language support to match those of our players and communities around the globe. With that in mind, we'd like to take this episode of Inside Star Citizen and introduce you to one of the newest teams being built here. Now, currently less than six months old, let's meet some of the folks working to bring localization support to Star Citizen and Squadron 42. I'm Yagoda. I am the localization lead uh, at CH. Soy Brice Fajardo, soy especialista en control de calidad de localización y vengo de España. I'm Jonathan Lowndes, and uh, I am the localization and English dialogue pipeline producer. Hola, mi nombre es María Laura Palestrini, eh, soy especialista en localización eh, para español en CIG. Donc, je m'appelle Yannick Simonclin, et je suis uh, le spécialiste localisation à, à CIG à Francfort. Localization is much more than just translation. We have the full control of the tone we want to give to the game. The localization specialists want to break the language barrier. We are really, really trying to give players the best experience we can. And understanding how important it is to take games to other audiences. We started thinking about localization very early at CAG. Well, usually uh, localization is uh, one of the last steps in uh, game development. In this particular situation, we wanted to make sure we have aligned uh, everything from legal text, marketing, uh, dialogue, scripts for dubbing, anything that has to do with UI, descriptions. We want to make sure that everyone can enjoy the game, regardless of wherever they are in the world. Normally what I do in a day-to-day -day basis is adapt to the text type I have to deal with pertaining translation. We also have to adapt that whatever is not translatable in words is actually understandable anyway. It's about experience, right? It's about culture. I found out from the Korean community, they actually made this uh, Korean patch for Star Citizen. And I guess that made me realize the users are actually willing to play games in their own language if they could. That actually like motivates me a lot. There are a lot of conversations with other departments to make this as immersive as possible. As LQA specialist, I'm in charge to, once we have those translations implemented in the game, to ensure that those translations are both working correctly and they are correct in the context. We use a tool called Starwords, in which Narrative inputs their English text, and after they approve it, it gets sent to us via the same tool, during which process we export it out into our translation tool, then uh, we translate it, proofread it, edit it, and uh, do any necessary corrections as needed, and then export it back into Starwords and from Starwords into the game. Visually, you can see the work that an art team or a cinematics team do, and you can go, yeah, I can see the flair there, but it's not if you until you speak a lot of these languages, you understand that maybe there's an Easter egg, maybe the wording is like similar, is like lifted from a Han Solo monologue or something, and then you're like, oh my god, you squeezed that in and it fits. That's the coolest thing I've ever seen. <laughs> it's, uh, we, ca we have to be very careful uh, to adapt the product to well, like there is in a format and a appropriate form for each locale. To be fair, I think a lot of Korean people are fairly familiar with Western culture, so we use a lot of like English words, sometimes as a meme, sometimes that's just as a like professional terms. A word that <laughs> that is very very common, and it's uh, like in European Spanish people to grab something. Uh, is ser, coger, which in Latin America, in most countries in Latin America, it means to have intercourse. So that's a, that's a really funny difference that we laugh about all the time. <laughs> As a producer, I have my eyes 
12, 18, 20 months down the line at any given point because I live in spreadsheets and I have to try and plan everyone's schedules out all the way into the future. So having recently been spending a lot of time in that, there's some stuff in there that I'm not allowed to talk about, um, but I can't wait until everyone gets to see it. We are all very passionate about the projects, both Squadron 42 and Star Citizen, and we want to make sure that the translations provided are the best possible. Um, we know that our community is very engaged and we know there have been other translation endeavors for Star Citizen as well. But we try to engage every single user, not only the people who have played the game for a considerable duration of time. So bear with us, not every translation will be as you think it could be. Uh, we will tr try to make improvements as much as possible and we hope that you're going to like it. The Siege of Orison was the Persistent Universe's biggest and most ambitious dynamic event yet, pushing at the seams of AI, server performance, FPS systems, and more. And while it recently returned to players in last week's Pirate Week celebration, we wanted to check in with the team and discuss some of the fixes and adjustments that went into this second wave of events and the advancements to all of Star Citizen that came from this technology-stressing event. We were watching the same stream at the same time, and I see Elliot Giving him little little hints. Desperate to give away the secret. I, I was just very excited. And he's getting more and more obvious. And I'm like, Elliot, maybe to a point where I can't write what I want to say in the chat anymore. So I'm texting him. Stop. Stop. Just stop. You are going to give it away. And ultimately he did. The whole point of Siege was to push FPS and um, healing gameplay, right? Like, and, and looting and all that. Like, it'd been in the game for several releases, or some of it, and like, it wasn't being used to its fullest extent. Um, and we thought, well, what better way to use that and actually show players that they, you know, the consequences of being downed. The cool thing about Siege is. When we have a big event like this, it, it gets us a lot of sort of improvements to the game. You know, because of Siege, there was some sort of more of a focus on looking at some of the back end type performance, and they found issues, and that's unlocked 100 player ser uh, servers for people. It helped to, to push towards it. Over the course of it, like already running, you know, me and Luke was watching streams, and we was having constant conversations as to ways we could improve this mission. Not only for future iterations on it, but also just in the quick patches we can get out. Um, we uh, we fixed the the bug where when you completed an objective, you wasn't instantly paid. You should have been instantly paid, but instead what was happening was it wasn't being given instantly, but it was collecting. So when the mission ended, it awarded it all at once. Uh, we fixed a number of flow breaking issues as well, like where bosses would just fall through the floor and be unreachable. We added an objective, uh, a secondary objective for disabling the anti-air and give a reward for it. So, you know, players knew that it it was something you could do, but also it isn't the main focus. We've taken steps to um, prevent griefing around that first uh, area that you get off of a shuttle. Um, we've, we now spawn uh, Crusader security that kind of take up uh, guard posts at those at that shuttle stop. We hope that's enough to kind of um, ward off the griefers. We we changed how the ending kind of happened. Before it was very like, you got an audio line saying, please leave, and then that was kind of reoccurred. Uh, we also added this to the HUD so players can see actively a please leave. When any player leaves the area, the mission will complete for them and they'll get all their extra rewards that were required. One thing we noticed was players were server hopping when the event had finished to try get another uh, try getting another event that had just started and because of that they wasn't getting all the rewards uh, from the mission because of that 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 bug I previously explained as well. We are working on dialogue improvements. There is that in the sky. I've got heavy hits locking down yeah, the platforms. At Solanki platform. You don't stand a chance. Uh, as we noticed, uh, you know, a few issues and ways we could tighten up some of the dialogue and audio lines. Working on extra things to do in the mission, so even if people do arrive late, they'll have something to do. Uh, and many other things like that, but I don't want to go too much into it. Thanks to everyone who's participated in Siege of Horizon. It's been 
like really fun watching you guys and hearing your feedback on playing the event. So what did we learn this week? Well, we learned that the localization team is hard at work reinterpreting Squadron 42 for several languages and cultures around the world. That turning an eye to Star Citizen will begin with external web resources before they dive into the depths of the Stanton system, and that the Siege of Orison wasn't just a fun event for our players, it pushed the underlying technologies in ways that have improved experiences for every aspect of life in the Persistent Universe. Now remember that our CitizenCon livestream will be this October 8th at 8 a.m. Pacific, 3 p.m. UTC, and it's really like an entire season of ISCL crammed into a single quarter day. There's gonna be some cool stuff. For Inside Star Citizen, I'm Jared Huckabee. We'll see you all here next week.